So, hi, I'm Pam Samuelson, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, I, I think it's actually a good idea to begin by saying that although the conversation that we're going to be having here is an American conversation, and in the American conversation, uh, at least in theory, there is no intellectual property rights in legal information um, that has been produced or adopted by the government. But in uh, a number of other countries, uh, actually copyright in laws, copyright in uh, other forms of legal information is really quite common. So uh, part of what I think uh, this current initiative may do uh, is, uh, especially if it does what we think it's going to do, which is give rise to a lot of, of innovation and a lot more uh, public engagement with legal information. Uh, maybe this can not just be a good demonstration project for, uh, for the United States, but also for other countries, because uh, there are debates going on in other countries about whether copyright in legal information is a good idea or a bad idea. So um, I think it's good to put that in context. Uh, uh, part of the reason that it's good to put that in context, too, uh, is that most of uh, the kind of common law evolution uh, in America, um, at least especially in the 19th century, was really looking to England, um, uh, looking to English case law, looking to what was the understanding there. And so part of what's interesting to me is that very early on in the 19th century, uh, there were efforts by compilers of legal information, usually judicial opinions, um, to say, I have copyright in this, and if somebody else uh, tries to copy it, uh, then uh, they're infringing my copyright. And so there are really quite a n large number of cases involving, um, uh, involving legal information. And notwithstanding the fact that the, the, the British have used copyright to protect information, the courts in the United States uh, have uh, overwhelmingly said that things like laws, judicial opinions, regulations, Anything that's kind of government-endorsed law is uh, something that's in the public domain and not available for copyright protection. Uh, and so there's a series of decisions uh, uh, dating back uh, quite a ways. But uh, notwithstanding the fact that those decisions established some precedents of no copyright in laws, no copyright in judicial opinions, no copyright in other uh, government information. The 20th century witnessed quite a few lawsuits about uh, about copyright claims uh, too. So once you couldn't get copyright in the actual text of the law, there was still an effort to say, well, I can get, I, okay, I won't claim that now, but I'm going to claim this other thing. Um, so one of my favorite of the old cases is a case called Long versus Jordan. Long published a little pamphlet about a pension plan system that he thought was a real neat thing and that uh, ought to be uh, ought to be adopted. And uh, the Secretary of State uh, of uh, California actually read the pamphlet and said, "Great idea!" Uh, and so uh, he essentially transformed the, the the information in the in the in the pamphlet into a, a, a bill. Um, or a, a, an, an initiative uh, that was going to be adopted or not by the people of California. And then Long says, hey, that's copyright infringement. Um, and he not only wanted copyright uh, royalties for having made that available, you know, having uh, for the promulgation, right, to the public in California that um, that, 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 that initiative uh, was copyright infringement. He wanted royalties for the plan when it got adopted, too. And the court said, no, um, that's, not, uh, the, that's, not, uh, that's not something that copyright will protect. The court decided that the pension plan was actually an idea uh, that, uh, and not an expression that could be protected by copyright. And so uh, that was one uh, decision. But uh, there also were uh, a number of decisions uh, involving things like pagination. So 
uh, one of the things that uh, that West Publishing had, which was an advantage over Lexis for a period of time, is that West was putting page numbers for each particular page in, the, in a case, inserting information about the pagination in the judicial uh, decisions, and, uh, and then Lexis decided that you know, yeah, people can get access to the opinions, but you got to be able to cite to the exact place. So then you still either have to use uh, Westlaw or you have to look at the books in order to get the actual pin site. So they said, well, we're going to put uh, a little star and the page number in each of the decisions. And West sued them for a copyright infringement, saying that the pagination was actually part of the copyrighted selection and arrangement of the cases. Uh, and although I think it was a very uh, weak uh, argument, um, it persuaded the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and so West actually was able to stop uh, that star pagination. Now, I think most uh, scholars would say today that um, that, that decision was wrong. Um, and the Supreme Court's decision in Vice versus Rural Publications uh, which said that there has to be creativity in order for there to be copyright and the idea that there's creativity in the pagination um, of particular decisions. Not like West like take a, took, so, take, uh, took a look at this particular case and said, I think this one should start at page 939, okay? Um, <laughs> it's just not a plausible thing to, uh, to think. Uh, and so um, uh, I think that the, the creativity-based requirement uh, for uh, originality in any body of things with, um, with legal uh, opinions and judicial opinions in it is, uh, is pretty weak. Now, Wes also, uh, when, that, uh, uh, when, the, when another competitor besides um, uh, Lexis came along, uh, Wes said, well, okay, we exercise, we're, we go through all the opinions and we, we correct things, right? So the, the, the citation to a particular page uh, and the quotation might be wrong, and so we fix all that stuff. And so because it requires an exercise of careful judgment, um, uh, and some skill, and you know, you got to have a little, teeny little bit of creativity. And the Supreme Court said only a modicum of creativity is really required. Uh, so uh, they thought they would be able to uh, claim copyright because of this correction, and the courts uh, rejected that particular argument. So I think we're in pretty firm territory there. Uh, another a set of skirmishes. I don't think this was actually. Um, litigated as a copyright matter, but I know that West Publishing also is claiming uh, that the numbering, that they contribute numbering uh, information to laws, and then they were claiming, well, okay, I can't protect the, the text of the law, but if you want to protect, the, you can you can publish the text of the law, you just can't use our numbers that are associated with that particular thing. And of course, it's an indirect way of trying to get protection for that which you're not supposed to get protection. Uh, the, uh, the building code issue that, uh, that Carl raised uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit ago uh, is also been um, uh, litigated. Uh, Beak versus the Southern Building Code case uh, is one where uh, Beak is like a guy. Um, and he likes putting stuff up on the internet. Uh, and so he thought this building code uh, had been adopted by these towns in Texas. Uh, essentially, this is the building code of our town. Uh, the building code had been drafted by this nonprofit building code uh, uh, organization, and they claimed copyright in it. And as long as it was not adopted by any uh, by any government, I think the argument that they could claim copyright in it is a pretty good one, although I think there would also be pretty good fair use claims for at least some nonprofit uses of that kind of information. Uh, but uh, Vic got sued uh, for copyright infringement uh, because he posted this online. He was also sued for breach of a shrink wrap license because in order to get the book, 
that he scanned in order to put it up on the internet. He had to, um, he had to uh, say he wouldn't make any but these restricted uses of it. Uh, and so uh, what you had is then a kind of interesting question uh, that uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, ultimately resolved in favor of Veek on the copyright claim, saying that once the, the uh, once this building code had been adopted as the law of uh, these particular towns, uh, that it was um, uh, that it was now a fact that copyright could not extend to. Um, it was kind of a weird argument that adoption of this makes it a fact, but whatever, they reached the right decision um, on, the, on the substance. But uh, I actually, when I was writing an article about this case, uh, uh, for an article about uh, whether copyright should extend to standards uh, more generally, this, uh, uh, I looked for you know, these building codes online, and they weren't. Um, and I think what happened in that case is, although Beak won, on the copyright claim, uh, he still was bound by the shrink wrap license. And so some part of what we have to uh, get around is that there's more than one way to try to control um, and get copyright-like protection, even when the courts are willing to say uh, that you can't uh, do that. So, um, uh, you know, uh, Veek actually is a very important precedent. I think the uh, if the issue got to the Supreme Court, I'm really quite sure that they would endorse it and actually have better reasoning about it. Uh, I think that um, you know the American Law Institute drafts model laws. Uh, that's another privately drafted uh, thing where it's a model law. They're hoping for states to adopt it. Um, they've gotten to the point where um, if the state actually adopts it, then they're not going to claim copyright in the adopted law. And that's actually a good thing. But um, well, until it's adopted, ALI controls it. Um, again, some fair uses uh, are allowed uh, of it. But there's, there are these kind of copyright uh, restrictions still. And uh, also, um, um, you know, technical protection measures, right? If so, so, so suppose, that, um, suppose that Brian doesn't have um, it doesn't have a Lexus uh, or a Westlaw account, and suppose I do, and suppose I let him use my, my name and uh, my password to get access to it. In theory, um, I'm breaching uh, my contractual obligation to these organizations not to use, not to let it be used. Um, I'm also uh, uh, potentially violating the Digital Millennium Copyright Act's anti-circumvention provisions because I'm enabling the circumvention of an access control uh, that a copyright owner is using to protect access to a work. Um, and maybe I'm violating, or he's violating, if he uses it, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which, um, uh, which forbids either unauthorized access to a federal interest computer um, or uh, exceeding authorized access. So, uh, so there are still a set of things that happen that kind of that provide uh, copyright-like uh, protection to legal information. Um, and uh, so, uh, while I think we can plot our course to make this stuff available, states uh, are going to be, I think, a little more resistant uh, because the federal government claim, claim copyright in laws in its legal information because the copyright statute specifically forbids works of the US government from being protected by copyright law. But it doesn't mean that they are not going to, um, uh, that states are going to uh, follow suit. And so Carl has some stories, and others do too, about efforts to uh, use copyright um, for state legal information. So, um, I, you know, copyright has been the main story here. Um, I do think before I hand this over to uh, uh, to Brian that it's worth mentioning that uh, that there have been patents issued on a lot of legal methods in the last decade, in particular. Um, and although patents haven't really been um, a restriction so far on public access to 
uh, to legal information um, unless the Supreme Court um, announces in the case that it's about to issue any day in Bilski versus Kapos that legal uh, methods uh, are not patentable subject matter, um, patent landscape could end up being something of an impediment to the free access to online information uh, that I think uh, we have as our goal. And um, I agree with uh, Carl very much that what we haven't seen really uh, in this world of mostly the two big proprietary services is a lot of innovation. And I think if you have a public resource uh, where kind of information can be remixed and mashed up and um, as long as there's some authenticated source, I think that's uh, something that Carl is really tackling. I think it's really important. But competition and innovation is part of what intellectual property policy is supposed to be about, too. So um, with that, I think I'll ask Brian. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Carver. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the School of Information at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm one of the lawyers that they keep in the building, um, but I'm surrounded by a very interdisciplinary faculty and um, a group of uh, very diverse masters and PhD students, uh, one of them I'll tell you more about uh, later. Um, and I, I wanted to start, I'm going to hit several things sort of very quickly because of the 10 minutes uh, and then can maybe expand on any of these in question. Um, I think I'd start with some of the bases on which uh, the courts have uh, decided that um, intellectual property law ought to stand out of the way when it comes to access to primary legal materials. Um, one of those Pam just mentioned, that uh, works of the U.S. government are born in the public domain. This is a statutory basis. It's right there in the Copyright Act. Right? And so at least for federal uh, judicial opinions, for instance, um, that those are works of U.S. government employees, is one way to think about it, and so they start off in the public domain um, just by statute. Right? Another basis by which we've seen courts uh, decide these sorts of things is um, sort of a mixture of judicial doctrine, but that also has, uh, is supported by the statutory scheme of the Copyright Act, and that's that facts are not copyrightable. Right? The, um, <clears throat> the, the, the laws of the land are facts, right? and so you can restate those facts. There's not a lot of creative expression, uh, if you do much statutory analysis, um, <laughs> in, in this stuff sometimes. And, and, so, <clears throat> and, and so some courts, anyway, have relied on this basis uh, to say that uh, um, copyright shouldn't uh, apply. But the, uh, the third basis that I would highlight um, is a constitutional one. Right? There's a, a due process and a First Amendment right, argument that uh, intellectual property law cannot uh, impede the public's access to the law. Right? If we are going to hold people to the standard that ignorance of the law is no excuse, um, then there's a due process problem with not allowing people access to this law uh, that ignorance of you know, leads them to peril. Right? Um, and uh, if we don't allow people to speak about the law, then there's a First Amendment problem right, um, by allowing one person a property interest uh, in the law. Now, and, and I think uh, this, this third basis, the constitutional basis, um, ought to trump some of these contract uh, concerns that, that Pam highlighted, right, that um, people are using those as sort of an in run around the statutory and the copyright um, uh, restrictions, and um, we need not only rely right on, on statutory uh, bases or precedential bases uh, for for this. There's also, I think, a very strong constitutional uh, basis for these sorts of arguments. Um, and <clears throat> to to give you a, a quick run through of the, the, the sort of the history of these cases, I would just recommend to you uh, Carl's pamphlet, the Three Revolutions in American Law. He takes you through the story of uh, Wheaton v. Peters and Banks v. Manchester and the building code cases, and it's a, you know an excellent exposition of, of that. It's available online for free. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, 
I think those are accurate bases um, from which to argue uh, that IP has to stand out of the way here. One that I would say is really not so strong um, and that sometimes the, uh, the folks who want to assert copyright um, try to spin to their advantage is the idea uh, that judges are already paid to do their job right? and so they, should, they don't need copyright and so some people have tried to interpret some of these older cases as having that as their foundation. I don't think that's right. Um, and it's a weaker foundation than, than the constitutional argument or, or some other argument because a lot of people are paid to create copyrighted works and we think that they're entitled to copyright. So there has to be something more right, going on here than just judges are paid. So they don't, that's, that's not really, I, I don't think, what the Supreme Court um, was, was deciding these cases on. Um, so there's, like I said, very quickly, right? Some some things we could talk about more in questions. But let me talk quickly then also about um, if we have all these different ways, right, in which uh, IP is supposed to stand out of the way. Why do we have so much frustration, right, with actually getting access to this stuff um, currently? Um, there's a lot of ways in which I'm constantly frustrated uh, by the uh, abil my ability to get free uh, public access to to these kind of documents. Some of these are IP problems. Um, others are problems with the current uh, technological tools that we have, but I think um, solving the IP problem might uh, solve the technology problem too, and I'll explain in a minute. So let's start with federal. Um, I would encourage you to uh, go to uh, www.cand.uscourts.gov. This is the, court, uh, the Northern District of California website. Um, <clears throat> and look for written opinions, right, without logging into PACER, right? There is a written opinions page. I did this last night. Um, and there are 110 opinions listed on that page, and there's, there's no next button, there's just 110 opinions, and they stretch over about the last six years, right? Now, maybe you're not familiar with the output of the Northern District of California, <laughs> but 110 opinions over the last six years is nowhere near, right, the output uh, in terms of written opinions of that court. That's all I could get access to last night when I tried to see what could I get for free without a, a PACER account, right? Because if I have to have a PACER account, right, I also have to have a credit card, right? And that, to me, is not public access to, right, free legal materials, primary legal materials. Um, <clears throat> but right, the reason I picked that court is they also have a survey right now on their uh, website redesign. Please take the survey and say, I came here looking for free legal opinions, and you only have 110. Well, please give me you know, a list of all the free opinions. If they're supposed to be free, why can't I get a free list of them so that I can then click on them, right? You know, um, <clears throat> and so my, I, I did that last night. If all of you <laughs> right, uh, also uh, take their survey, maybe they'll get the message. Um, <clears throat> let's move to the circuit courts in the federal system. Um, it, I, I wonder if you guys know uh, who the sort of least forthcoming circuit court is right now, right? You know, sort of who's doing the who, who I grade the, the lowest right, on public access to their documents. Turns out I give the sort of booby prize to the DC circuit. Um, <clears throat> the, every other circuit makes both their published and unpublished or non-precedential opinions available for free on their websites without a PACER account. Yay. But the DC circuit only makes the published opinions available their unpublished uh, or non-presidential opinions are behind the PACER paywall and you can only get them there. Um, <clears throat> that's not the only way in which they're less than forthcoming. Many of the other circuit courts um, provide oral argument audio for free on their sites. Um, I love this stuff. Um, and the DC circuit has a bizarre policy about oral argument transcripts and audio. The, you should go read the policy on their website. First they say, <clears throat> that only the litigants are even entitled to get access to the transcript until the case is over. Right? I mean, when the Comcast v. FCC decision had oral argument, I blog about these things and I was like, oh, I'd love to go read the transcript or see if there's oral argument audio and find out, you know, how the argument went down. <clears throat> I, I, I was met with this policy that I've got to be one of the litigants to even get access to the transcript, right? And there's no audio at all. Um, at least not online. You can request, after the case is concluded, this audio, 
but at, if no one requests it, after a year or two, I think the policy says they destroy it, right? And so we're losing this resource um, if people don't request this stuff. <laughs> and uh, to me, that's a disaster, um, mainly because uh, I do research, right? And I find those kinds of things enormously illuminating uh, when I want to understand what went on in a case, right? Um, and uh, Professor Sanders and I have the experience of researching a, a, an old copyright case from 1880, and I feel like even there I was able to find more materials than I'll be able to find about some cases from 2004 right now, you know, because at least with old Supreme Court cases, somebody was writing down roughly what the oral arguments were, what cases were cited, um, and, and these sorts of things. And now we're recording the stuff and then throwing it away. Um, in, in fact, uh, the Ninth Circuit, I think, had a statement like that on their site many years ago, and I wrote to the Internet Archive saying, do you guys know about this? They're deleting the audio after two years, right? Somebody needs to be saving this stuff. I don't have a big enough hard drive. Can you do it? You know? um, and, you know, it's, I think, if you're, if there, I think there are librarians out there, I've seen some of you, and archivists, I, I think you have the same panic that I do about losing forever, right, you know, valuable research materials, and that's going on right now. Um, if we move to the state court system, uh, when you go to the California uh, Supreme Court and Appellate Court uh, Opinions website, there is this really nice message that says there's no copyright in judicial opinions. Thumbs up for them for that. Um, but I think you can only get about back to January of this year in terms of those opinions sort of for free on their site without logging them. Um, if you want anything older than that, Lexis is providing this service um, for them that lets you go back a little further and you're confronted with a EULA that says who knows what, right, you know, and um, you, you have to agree not to scrape the site or run a web crawler on it and collect up this public information and give it out to others, which is the kind of thing I like to do. Um, and <laughs> so uh, you're really only, again, getting a, a smattering uh, and it's going away over time. Um, don't even get me started on the trial courts, right, in, in any state. Um, uh, just to take Alameda County, uh, where, where Berkeley is, uh, for an example, if you try to look up documents on the Superior Court of Alameda County's website, you can't find anything without first entering a case number. I can't enter a party name. <laughs> I can't search by any other feature. I have to know RG093365 before I can do anything on their website. That, that's impossible. That's not public access, right? Um, so, and then of course the documents are in TIFF or some crazy format, that, you know, and you get one page at a time, and it's five thousand megabytes. Right? Anyway. So, trial courts are a disaster, right, um, in terms of public access. Um, how about state statutes? Uh, I've, I've heard Carl before at, at these events say that there are at least eight states that assert copyright in their statutes. Despite right, uh, this long history of cases saying there's no uh, copyright in the law. Um, and so we need this you know, effort to sort of alert people to this, right? There are some people who haven't gotten the memo, right? There are some states who are still asserting this and, and creating a problem for those who want to uh, access and redistribute this information. Okay, so some of those are technical problems. Some of them are IP problems, but I, Here's how I think they're, they're all actually connected to IP. Even these things that are technical problems with bad websites or, or whatever, I think they become more glaring right, if there were a national movement like this right, that made abundantly clear that primary legal materials are outside of IP's purview and should be publicly accessible. Right? If, if we get that message out there through something like this, then we can all write a letter and sign it to the D.C. Circuit and say, look, you know, the policy of the United States is this. Why are you doing this other thing, right? And um, it'll have, I think, more impact and we'll be able to solve even the technical problems um, through a clarification of the IP status of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> so Pam also asked me to talk about sort of what if IP law did get out of the way, what sort of innovations would be possible? Um, and for years, I've been uh, inspired by uh, Carl's work at resource.org, the Cornell uh, Legal Information Institute that was mentioned earlier, 
uh, Fast Case, Justia, Fine Law, all these folks who have had for years uh, been trying to make um, primary legal materials available to the public for free. Um, I, I may have never met you or emailed you before, but I've been cheering for you from my computer terminal for years now, right? Um, and so <clears throat> um, I think uh, if we got something like the law.gov process pushed through, you'd see at least two kinds of uh, innovations. One would be on the technical side, and one would be on the research side. Um, on the technical side, you just would make all of those people's jobs much easier, right? You know, if you give them all the primary legal materials and then let them focus on building great search engines or uh, uh, categorization schemes or better websites that are more user-friendly, whatever else, um, it, it cuts an enormous, as Carl mentioned, uh, you know, cost out of doing business in the space and allows them to focus their limited resources um, on those other sorts of technical innovations. Um, I, I don't want the courts to get in the business of trying to make clever search engines. Just give me the materials and let's let nonprofits and private entities uh, sort out how to uh, best provide that information. I think there are a lot of folks out there who would do that. Um, on the uh, research side of things, um, I have research questions that I really can't answer right now because they'd be too costly. Um, for instance, uh, cyber law is one of uh, the areas that I teach about and do research in. And there are a lot of cases where, <clears throat> uh, in the internet context, where people get upset with an anonymous commenter on some website and they decide to sue maybe you know, the website or maybe a John Doe um, and they want to unmask that anonymous commenter and there are First Amendment concerns about your right to anonymous speech, and then there's also defamation, you know, uh, often involved in those cases. And what you find when you look at a bunch of those cases is that it seems like people are mostly motivated by finding out who it was that said this nasty thing about them, and they don't really care about the defamation claim that they, you know, purported to have in order to bring the lawsuit. And so these cases disappear very quickly. Right? They're almost never appealed. We, we have a very hard time getting written opinions um, in these cases, much less a Supreme Court uh, opinion on this topic, which could greatly clarify uh, the uh, First Amendment uh, rights to anonymous speech issues that come up in these cases. Instead, what we get are varying standards and approaches from various states and district courts, and it's a mess um, when we, what we're interpreting is a constitutional question. What I'd like to do is be able to search all of PACER right, and find out how many of these suits were filed and went away before there was any opinion at all. I and mean, I don't know about them at all. Right? Um, that I, that these are the cases I don't teach in my class because they disappeared before there was even that first motion to dismiss or something. Right? Um, it would cost, I don't even know what my patient bill would be right, for me to uh, look into that. Right. And a lot of these cases get filed in state court, and I've already told you, right, the trial courts are a mess at the state level. Right? You get a thousand different systems, and who knows what you get. Right? So it's just sort of technically impossible for me to answer a research question that I have right now. Um, and, and to the extent it is possible, it's cost prohibitive. Right? You know, so why should we impede research in that way? Right? That's, that doesn't make any sense. Well, on the technical innovation side, um, one of the things that I promised I'd mention is uh, a site that a student of mine has been working on is his master's final project. Um, so the problem I also have as a researcher is I like to stay abreast of current developments in the law on an instantaneous basis, right? You know, um, I want to know when a new circuit court opinion comes out about copyright or trademark or, or some of my other areas of interest the same day um, because I might blog about it and old news is not news at all. Right? Or, or um, I might want to uh, teach about it in my classes, I might want to add it to some research paper I'm working on, and so on. Um, other people, I think, have the same sort of need. Journalists, right, um, who want to write about developments in the law need timely information about new developments in the law. Um, and there's the general public who has all sorts of reasons for wanting to keep up with what's going on in the law. Supposedly, we're bound by this. Um, and you, there are some pay services that provide this sort of daily awareness type service. Um, and I happen to have access to Lexis and West, and so I can try to use their systems 
to do this sort of thing. I find it very unsatisfactory, actually, because they send me, you know, just today I think I got alerted to opinions from March, and I'm like, well, thanks now for telling me about this, but why, you know, it seems like they alert me when they get around to putting the opinion in their database, and it may not be same day or four hours later, which is what I really want. Um, and um, so, and I don't want to pay for the service. I don't think the public, right, um, who needs this information should have to pay for it. I think it should be available for free. And so I managed to interest a student uh, in, in this problem and get him to build a court listener, as in listen, right, um, dot com. And um, it solves this problem, right? Uh, it's in its early beta stages, right, you know, um, and, and uh, we owe a debt to a lot of people who have worked on these kinds of issues before. Um, but um, it's, it's a good start, right? Uh, it's, it's already working for me and, and helping with this problem. Because your alternative was to visit all 13 circuit court websites um, and the Supreme Court's website and click on the page for published opinions, look at the case names and try and think about is that party likely to be involved in a copyright dispute? Boy, I don't know. Okay, let's click on it and read a paragraph or two and see. And it's just, it's not feasible, right? You can't keep up with uh, the uh, areas of law that you're interested in in that way. And so um, by us creating a search engine that scans the full text of these opinions and gives people alerts based on their uh, stated interests, um, I get delivered in my email inbox a list of the opinions that are likely to be on topics of, that I'm interested in, and I can focus my efforts on reading those. Um, so, law.gov would have helped my student a lot, right? If you, if you guys were done, um, wow, that would have been easier for him. Um, he spent most of his time and most of the code uh, building the web crawler or scraper to visit all these different websites and try to collect up all these opinions and um, store them down in our database. If there were just this authenticated feed from the source that Carl talks about, we could just take that and instantly right, start uh, applying our search engine to it. it. The opinions would probably look prettier if they would come in some sort of XML format or something else. Instead, we get PDFs and we do our best converting them to plain text. And when you use justified margins, all hell breaks loose. And, and so um, it's it's, there's tough technical problems we face now just because of the way uh, uh, things are made available. And so if we could get sort of primary legal materials pushed out um, at the source, uh, most of the technical effort uh, that we had to go through to get to this point would be over. And we could focus on uh, making the site prettier, making the opinions look prettier, uh, fixing a lot of things that are you know, buggy right now. He did a great job, but it's, it's a long way uh, from perfect right now. Um, and so um, that's just a, a, a tiny window into the kinds of things uh, that you could do uh, on the technical side uh, if we got immediate access at the source. Right? You could do it much more easily. I'll stop there. Well, I got a question. Um, I'll certainly lead it off. Uh, so Tim Stanley from Justia, who you'll be hearing from a little later, and I uh, got takedown notices from the state of Oregon um, because we had the Oregon Revised Statutes online. And the Legislative Council of Oregon, who published the Oregon Revised Statutes, said they were not asserting copyright over the statutes themselves because nobody can copyright the law, but they were asserting copyright over the annotations and the section names and the section numbers. Um, and so I have really two questions. Uh, question number one, is there any support in the law for a state actor, the Legislative Council of Oregon, to be asserting that copyright over that material? And then what happens if it's not a state actor? What happens in the state of California, for example, where the state says the basic opinions are available, but if you want the section names and numbers or other things, then, then you need to go to our official reporter who happens to be a vendor. And I was wondering if you could comment on the intellectual property issues there. So I think that it's a little murky out there um, in some of these spaces. Um, and so uh, the, the, the text of the statute is something that he concedes. Um, but the, the numbers and descriptors, I think, um, in a good copyright system, 
um, are not protected by copyright law. Um, uh, the, um, the, the numbers, uh, so part of the reason why this isn't as clear um, as it should be is there are some uh, decisions that have taken um, a very broad view of copyright for numbers associated with descriptive names. So let me just briefly uh, go over that, um, uh, one of these cases, um, which I tried to stab um, in this article questioning copyright and standards. Um, uh, judge Easterbrook, uh, a very well-known judge in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, wrote a, an opinion in a case called um, uh, American Dental Association versus Delta Dental. And so uh, the American Dental Association had come up with uh, had come up with a coding scheme for um, for different types of procedures that dentists do, so that they could use the numbers when they filled in the forms to, uh, for insurance and other kind of reporting purposes. So the idea was that there was a, you know by tooth um, and by the number of surfaces on the tooth. Um, and things like that, right? Then it's like one number for this, and so, you know, so the number was, let's say, um, 0, 5, 6, 7, um, point 0.1 is like the front surface of my front tooth. And then, so it was a number, a name of the procedure, and then a short description about the procedure. And what Delta Dental did was it republished the number and the short description, but not the, sh I mean, the, the name of the, uh, the, the like four word description, but not the sort of a little bit more elaborate thing. So they thought, okay, well, maybe copyright would attach to that, but if I just do the numbers and the name of the procedure, that can't possibly be copyright infringement. And in fact, um, uh, Judge Easterbrook says, it's creative. In fact, um, he's not only saying that the coding system as a whole is protected by copyright law, but in one of his rhetorical flourishes says um, that every number and every name of a procedure is an original work of authorship that copyright protects. Now, this is lunatic, okay? It can't possibly be true, but if I were the legislative council of the state of Oregon, I would probably look to something like the Delta Dental case and say, well, you see the name of this thing plus the, um, the, the number and the name of the procedure um, under Easterbrook's uh, um, has enough creativity in it, it could have been done a different way, right? Instead of uh, 08567.1, it could have been 064235. It's like, yeah, but um, this is the name of the procedure, and it's not like, you know, kind of ex expressive. It's like the name of my tooth and how many surfaces it has, okay? So there's something completely wrong about that particular decision. And fortunately, you may not like uh, Justice Roberts, uh, no, Alito, uh, for certain things, but I will tell you that uh, uh, then Judge uh, Alito uh, for the Third Circuit Court of Appeals wrote an opinion that rejected uh, a parts numbering system copyright claim, right? So um, somebody came up with a, a name and a number, right? Name and number for uh, parts of like um, uh, pieces of hardware, right? Like nails and stuff like that. So number, name, and claimed under Delta Dental that uh, that that was uh, that was copyright protected because there were other ways you could have done it, etc. And the Third Circuit, um, under Judge Alito's uh, uh, decision actually came out and said, no, that's not copyright protectable. So I would say that, uh, especially with Alito now being on the Supreme Court, um, that that Delta Dental case, which is what your guy would probably be relying on, has been repudiated um, by this later decision, uh, the analysis, 
Um, and I think that that's good law, and the other one is bad law. But of course, the Seventh Circuit um, and the Third Circuit, um, in some sense, have a have a split on that. And I think that there's an extra reason why, not just in the context of of numbers for filling out for private insurance, etc., purposes by private doctors, but when we're talking about laws, that policy that we've been talking about which is the public access to law has to be meaningful, then if you can't say what the name of the law is, and you know, this is the section about what kind of notice has to be given, and this is the section about sort of who has standing to sue, if you can't say that, then that's actually an impediment. So I think it's, it's this kind of effort, I think the policy argument is that this is an effort to circumvent the fundamental policy, and uh, I think that people like us have to push back uh, against efforts to use that. Now, I think comments about the law are a little bit more difficult um, because there, it may be some sort of elaboration about the um, about that uh, about what the the happened in the law, you know because it's a state and they do get to copyright stuff, it's a little harder for me to say. But I would say, especially for a nonprofit use of that, um, of that kind of information, um, I would say that even if there was copyright in the comments that uh, a nonprofit uh, use for the purpose of promoting public access to legal information um, would be fair use. That would be at least where I would go in terms of pushing back to uh, to that particular person. I would say about that, that um, I think, uh, I, I remember when this happened, uh, this was another instance when I was cheering from my computer terminal at a distance, uh, when I, and what I actually did, that this is the Oregon Revised Statutes, which they, which they often abbreviate ORS, so as soon as I saw that this happened, I registered the domain freeors.org and started and went and got a copy of the Oregon Revised Statutes and was trying to clean them up and post them as quickly as possible because I wanted to invite someone to sue me over it. I thought, you know, sue a copyright lawyer over this. Let's see how that goes. Right? Um, and and um, the, I don't think that's, and you managed to actually resolve it in a much more reasonable way uh, before I ever uh, finished it. And now we have OregonLaws.org, which is amazing, um, that a, a student at Lewis and Clark has um, put up. Um, much better than the site, I imagine. Uh, and um, before going into academia, I was in litigation. So I, I take this, uh, when I have a view, that, which I do, that the public ought to have free access to primary legal materials, um, and then someone confronts me with this sort of, we have copyright in our statute sort of argument, I take on the advocate's point of view sometimes a little too quickly and want there to be uh, litigation to say, <laughs> no, right, you know, actually you don't have a copyright in your statutes. Um, and, um, and where I would go, in, and, and Professor Samuelson is absolutely right that uh, the actual cases out there right now are on both sides, right, and that the Folks in Oregon could have looked at the Easterbrook opinion and thought they had support there. And she's also right that one of those is wrongly decided and some other decisions are, are, are more accurate, um, as, as a policy matter at least. Um, but what I think is that the constitutional basis that I mentioned earlier for uh, this argument has not been fleshed out to its full extent yet in the cases that we have. Right? That we've seen it relied on in some of these cases through the years. Um, but that there's more room for growth there, right? That um, I, I think when, if some of these kinds of instances aren't resolved in the more friendly way that Carl found to resolve it, right? You know, by going and talking to the folks in Oregon and saying, really? <laughs> you know, um, and having them back down. Uh, if we get into court on this, uh, I think you can stretch that constitutional basis further than it's been relied on thus far, and we can, um, do away with some of this nonsense. So I actually, I'd like to add one more thing, um, uh, and that is that um, that part of the problem that individuals have had with um, kind of efforts to claim copyright in this kind of information has been that very often, if it's a nonprofit or if it's an individual, 
they don't have the resources to litigate it. And so they kind of, even if they would have won, they, they don't have any sort of somebody to stand up for them um, and to make the other person sort of back down. And uh, now Carl is a force of nature, so um, uh, Carl can do it um, on his own. But, um, uh, but one of the reasons that um, I've helped to encourage uh, legal clinics to pop up at a number of law schools uh, around the country. There's one in Berkeley, uh, there uh, is one at USC Law School, there's one at American University, uh, there's one at Harvard, uh, there's one at uh, Fordham Law School now, is that there are public interest in intellectual property clinics. And so, you know, if you ever hear of somebody who in fact is wanting to do something and it's getting this kind of, oh, proprietary yada yada, um, then these are kinds of projects that the clinic students under the clinical professor's supervision love to take on. And, you know, just a, just a strong letter from, let's say, a Berkeley Law School professor um, uh, saying, you know, we think that this claim that you've made is ridiculous, is sort of something that then gives the, the little guy a chance to fight back in ways that when it's just that person, um, especially if it's not already a copyright lawyer like uh, Brian who uh, who's wants people to bring it on, um, uh, there's at least some other, there's now a resource out there um, that I think um, the kids love stuff like this. Are you, are you moderate? Yeah, yeah. No, you're moderate. Okay. Okay. Yes. How do you get around sort of some of these uh, shrink wrap license agreements or the uh, sort of user uh, access uh, agreements for uh, like the, the California case law that license provides? I mean, is there a way to do that or is this just like the new way just to block uh, copyright? I'm going to pass that question to Brian because he's done uh, a lot more research on it. I have good intuitions. Yeah, it, it is a problem. Um, if you don't have a taste for litigation, <laughs> right? Um, uh, there, one comparable situation that just recently came up is um, a, a guy wanted to collect all the public data that Facebook makes available, um, but he knew that the terms of use that Facebook has on the site might prohibit some of the collecting and reuse that he wanted to do. And he found a way to gather all the data without ever agreeing to or you know viewing their terms of use, collected a whole bunch of stuff, was about to make it public, and Facebook lawyers still managed to shut him down once they started sternly talking to him about it. Um, so even when you know you uh, sort of uh, try to avoid clicking to agree and preserving some argument that I'm not bound by this contractual uh, agreement, um, it, it still may not. Uh, succeed actually when uh, a bevy of lawyers come, you know, calling and, and sending you threatening letters. Um, it's it, it is this contract in runaround um, copyright law that um, a lot of people uh, are using right now, and I think it's totally illegitimate. Right? That um, if this stuff is outside the scope of copyright, if that's the decision. Uh, and policy that Congress has adopted, then private actors ought not be able through boilerplate click wrap agreements uh, to circumvent uh, Congress's policy decision um, and get copyright-like protection uh, through contract. Um, I think that, that those contracts are federally preempted and they, they ought not survive um, in the courts. Now, that was just the litigator's um, argument for you, it's not necessarily the reality, right? The cases are mixed, right? We get these uh, click, click wrap, wrap agreements enforced all the time. Okay. Okay. Judge Easterbrook uh, has, the, has the sort of the foremost uh, case on this, and, uh, and, uh, and that, that decision upheld the restriction um, uh, in the shrink wrap license. Uh, the Supreme Court having decided that um, having decided that uh, White Page's listings of telephone directories uh, was not uh, protectable by copyright law, um, a young guy named Zeidenberg uh, decided he wanted to put uh, the data 
from the white pages listings of uh, a database up on the internet. And he did it and thought, hey, copyright policy says I can do this. Um, but Judge Easterbrook enforced the shrink wrap restriction uh, that came with the, the CD that he got, uh, which then said he could only make personal use of it. Uh, and so there was a, a that, that, that was a case in which the copyright preemption argument that Brian was just uh, talking about was raised and rejected by, uh, by Easterbrook. Now, it is the case that other people um, and many commentators have, have criticized that decision, and so it's not as firm a ruling as the people who uh, want to say that all shrink wrap restrictions um, are enforceable. But on the other hand, it's an uphill battle in the face of decisions like that um, to say, now I think you get a stronger argument if it's legal information, because it's public access to law policy, I think, is stronger um, uh, as, that, uh, as a kind of public policy limitation on contract restrictions. So um, that's just, yeah. I, I also teach contract law. So uh, Pro CD, the Zeidenberg case, I think is a fantastic example because Easterbrook's opinion is still out there and the commentators hate it, um, but it's being used by everybody. And it's a collision of very strange co contract law that applies in the written world as well. And that is the courts now presume that you don't read contracts that you sign. And so that if you get the click, they've developed technical rules about when you hit the I accept little box on the screen that you actually accept everything that you could have looked at, but maybe it's got to be close enough that you don't have to scroll too far, but I think that contract law, and Pam, you probably know this way better than I do, but contract law really tried to completely capture uh, IP with the UCA stuff, and uh, got a lot of momentum up that, because contract can solve these problems, it can get rid of all the public interest stuff and say, this is all just a deal between you and the other contracting party under the old myth that all our contracts are eye to eye, arm's length deals, which of course are not. Um, but that got beaten back. Uh, yeah. And so now we're in this nether world where I think most commentators would say that Easterbrook and Pro CD is wrong. Uh, it's widely criticized, but it's still the stake in the ground and nobody's been able to get around it. And there, he followed up with some other decisions that even extended a little further about what it means. So it's one of those classic legal problems where there's a, a case that people don't like, but also people can't figure out a way to get around. And, and I think because of the problems of cognition and contractual relations written generally, it's hard for people to figure out. Barring your constitutional yeah. trapdoor, yeah. somebody's going to have to knock that precedent off. It's going to be very, very hard. There's actually a really neat little um, kind of idea that Jane Ginsburg, um, who teaches at Columbia Law School, had some years ago. So uh, there was this time when contract law, especially shrink wraps, um, were seeming to proliferate and um, seeming to be things that were going to take over. Uh, you didn't need copyright anymore because the shrink wrap was going to give you more control. Uh, and that's really what was behind uh, this thing that was uh, this licensing law for information, uh, once known as Article 2B of the Uniform Commercial Code, and then came came to be the uniform uh, the Uniform Law for Computer Information or something like that. Um, so that law actually, ten years ago, uh, it just seemed like it was inevitable that it was going to shrink wrap the entire world. And it hasn't come to pass. And so the kind of momentum, right? Uh, Easterbrook's opinion was written about the time that you see this freight train yeah. sort of seem like it's speeding down the tracks and could not be stopped at all. In fact, it was stopped utterly, um, except that Easterbrook's opinion has had this kind of continued life. But Jane, at, during the kind of time when we were debating, like, what are we going to do? And this thing that I, I'm doing with this information resource would have been fair use if this issue was raised in the context of copyright law. 
And so Jane came up with the idea of the maybe what a contract law needs is a right of fair breach, right? So fair use, <laughs> fair breach is a, a kind of a concept. Now it, it hasn't actually taken hold, um, but uh, well, because it there hasn't been that much litigation about it. Um, but preemption, misuse, uh, there's a kind of argument that that if you kind of use a shrink wrap license in order to essentially extend the scope of copyright, that that's a misuse of copyright through contract. That's an argument that a person could put their mouth around. And then there's this fair breach concept. And then it's well understood and, and uh, accepted uh, that there are public policy limitations on what you can do with contracts. Um, and so, you know, those are doctrinal things that are out there. And, you know, again, some of these clinics are willing to kind of push the envelope on, on some of these things. But I think we have to, we have to find the right case. Peter? Yeah, and there's a sort of an interesting analog in the Computer um, Fraud and Abuse Act. I mean, the classic problem that's presented in the Computer Fraud Abuse Act is the problem of a, of a, of a site license. You know, Warren Kerr's example of the KKK's uh, website that says in order to access the site, you have to sign off on our, on our principles. And then you have a university researcher who signs off on the principles to gain access to the website is the university researcher um, committing uh, the crime of unauthorized access to the website. Okay? And generally speaking, uh, the answer to that, if you look at old trespass cases, is no. Because under the old trespass laws, the courts were doing exactly the same thing where, for instance, if you went into a, a, an inn, which is a public place, and didn't pay your bill, it's, it, you may owe innkeeper for the bill for the for, for what you didn't pay for but it's not a trespass okay so even if the innkeeper even if there was an explicit agreement before you went in went into the public place it's still not a trespass the courts were recognized as a trespass um, obviously there has to be a similar analogy in the computer fraud abuse act and this idea of sort of fair breach strikes me particularly when you're trying to manage information uh, you know, you see, you see this very, these very, very, very interesting analogies across different sectors of the law. Um, you know, some of the same techniques that are being used in the context of trying to protect private information, mm -hmm. and the ideas that people have come up with to try to protect legitimate private information are exactly the same techniques that people are toying around on the copyright side to basically accumulate more power and more more control over the proprietary rights of the information. But but there's there's a funny way in which all these different areas of the law are starting to merge. Um, yeah. You know, the fair use, the fair breach, it's not a trespass. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very interesting moment in legal history where a lot of different ideas are converging. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, thanks for that. When you uh, speak for the first time, if you could introduce yourself, or at least your name, and that'll, that'll be helpful for our I'm, videographers. I'm Pete Wynn. I'm a, uh, I work for the Department of Justice. In the back? Oh, I, I have two. Uh, I'm Kathleen Wynn. I'm the Wong from UC Berkeley Law Library. I have two questions, one of which is a little bit rhetorical. Uh, in, the, in the Oregon case, say, say Brian had gotten his wish and had gone to litigation, wouldn't the... the the legislative counsel's office be kind of, kind of in a strange and absurd position arguing to a court that, I mean, the, the court itself presumably uses the ORS numbers all the time. And can you also sort of demonstrate the absurdity of that position by writing all of your briefs while avoiding any statute or any code <laughs> citations and citing everything to the session laws, which presumably the date of enactment and some quotation from, from the law. And you would have to go back through, you know, the statute passed in 2005, which amended the statute passed in 2009, which amended the code originally passed in, you know, 1874. Now it's sort of, <laughs> presumably, be annoying enough to the court, you know, cause them to think twice about that position. 
So that's well, I, I think it's I think that's a great argument, um, and you know I think it generalizes uh, also there you know there's more than just litigation uh, to uh, to solve these particular problems. I think that. Um, a little shaming or the, the uh, concern about bad publicity, um, especially in situations that would be fair breach-like situations, is that you can basically help educate some people that even if there's a contractual restriction, it would not be a good idea to push for that enforcement. And I think a lot of what's happened in these situations which I would regard as hypothetical fair breach situations um, is that faced with the need to litigate, even the person who has the shrink wrap restriction is in fact often, I think, declining to, to sue. Now, unfortunately, from the standpoint of lawyers, that's rotten because it means there's no precedent. But from the standpoint of real people, that works. Um, so, I think she had two well, questions. Oh, yeah, I'm the sorry. second one. Um, so, the courtinfo.ca.gov. Um, this, you know, the current opinions that are sort of just accessible, you know, to whatever extent they are, and then the searchable opinions archive. It goes back to 1850, so you know, it's in statehood, um, but it's behind the EULA. So, I mean, my question, which may be a little beyond your scope, is you know, what is it? Is it just that this was an easy way for the court to, you know, they just put it into the contract that Lexis, the, the contract for the official reporter, that Lexis would provide free search engine, but they could sort of put whatever terms on it, um, and you know, I guess what are what's what's the possibility for um, for making it less restrictive? without additional cost to the court system. Oh, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I would only be speculating as to, you know, why California decided to go this way, but it, you know, it seems like it's probably cost, right? You know, it's easier to have an outside vendor handle this than to try to do it yourself. Um, uh, and, um, but I guess two things about that. One is um, when government actors decide to use an outside vendor um, uh, with respect to information that ought to be in the public domain, they ought to build into every one, of, they ought to be required to build into every one of those contracts that you can't lock up, right, this information that's supposed to be in the public domain, right, you know, they just ought not allow it, and, and so there's that. But then the other thing is, I actually don't, I complain, right, that the free public portion of the California court website, you know, only goes back to January of this year or so, something like that. Um, but I really don't want them to be in the business of providing me a website that goes back to 1850, right? I want what Law.gov wants, you know, a full free feed from the source to let third parties provide that awesome uh, website that will go back to 1850, right? Just give me the documents, you know, give me a big tar zip of them, right? I don't care, right? You know, just get, you know, make those available in some form, even in raw form, um, but authenticated, um, and uh, let third parties, not the court system, um, you know, maintain a website that provides those to the public. But then presumably Lexus wouldn't play anymore. Well, we don't know that, actually. I think that part of why, I think, even in this, let's just assume that, that Carl's vision uh, materializes. I don't think that necessarily means that Lexis and Westlaw collapse in a pile um, because they have more than just the information that, um, uh, that we're looking to have be freely available. And so um, I think that there's still a market opportunity for them. I think it will actually put some the success of this project will put some pressure on them to be more price friendly, um, to create maybe more some more tiers, so that some of the public interest organizations that today can't afford to get access to that could get access to it maybe in the future. Um, it also puts uh, uh, it also puts pressure on them to to be less restrictive, and they don't want. I believe they don't want to come out and say oh, we hate all this open stuff. It's like, actually, they're going to have to learn to be good players in this, uh, in this uh, environment. And then 
you know, be clear about what value that they're adding besides whatever it is that is an overlap between what the law.gov is going to be doing and what they do. And then that's, I would concentrate if I were they on, you know, where my value add is. And they have a lot of things that no question, okay, Carl, I'm not going to be able to put up the treatises um, that, uh, that are written by, uh, by scholars. It's like, that's not what this project is about. This project is about making the public domain information uh, really available to the public. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I would agree with Professor Samuelson. Most of the vendors feel very strongly that they add true value to this data. They're not simply taking public domain data and, and offering it up, that they actually offer things that people will pay for. And as we said earlier, this is as much about innovation. I think companies like West and LexisNexis will face an IBM moment and they have to decide whether their business model will evolve over time. Uh, but they certainly have a tremendous opportunity and um, when you think about it, we're trying to make legal information available to a much broader audience. That's a bigger market and that's a market opportunity for the established vendors.